With Premium Collection 2020 announced and we had two ban lists since the previous one, I think it's the perfect time to reevaluate the winners and losers of Premium Collection 2019 and see if they hold the same value as at the time. Hey Carfighters, today I want to take a look back at Premium Collection 2019 and see what the cards or the strides of that set are doing today. As last year, I did a video where I evaluated the cards and decided to categorize them in winners or losers and everything in between to have a better understanding how good the cards are. And this was a different approach than just your typical set review as there were a bunch of different strides and it was way too much to go into every single detail of the cards. But of course, since we made that video, a lot have happened in the premium meta landscape. We of course had two new ban lists which hit multiple clans that were performing quite considerably with their new respective strides. But also we had a lot of new supporting sets and usually a new set doesn't really sh change premium all that much. But there were specific clans that got boosted to, a, to such a degree that strides that didn't really perform that greatly right at the box of premium collection 2019 they suddenly start dominating the meta in a significant degree where their value suddenly changed up a lot. And when we take a look at the standings of that previous video, you can see right here that some choices are really peculiar. A very noticeable thing is in the absolute winners category, we have Gridora as well as Busters for Nova Grappler and Mega Colony respectively, which aren't really that used today and not really even that used right out of the bat of the set because yes we had some over grappler uh, tops and victories with the bastard right out of the set but it was very soon apparent that the build wasn't as strong as most people anticipated as they needed a lot of key pieces to do their thing and even if they did it wasn't all that deadly as you were relying on getting multiple crits to your drive checks and if you didn't you really didn't do all that much and with all the excessive amount of drawing and drive checking that you would do with that build, deck out was also a big problem for the build. And for Ghidorah, the problem was it negated everything that your opponent did, but at the same time you also wouldn't really put up an offensive against your opponent. And other very strong builds that came out of the woodworks of that set really didn't bother about Ghidorah all that much, so Ghidorah had even more problems of being relevant, so that's why the deck didn't really perform all that well, even though that stride looked so insane on paper. Another very interesting things that might really pop up your eyes is the fact that Ichikishima, Gastil, Katrina and even Sparrowcross aren't in the absolute winner category, where the latter is even in the in-betweeners. Which is a telling sign that a lot has changed since this set. And that's very obvious as Premium Collection came out before Aerial Steed Liberation. So now that we have an understanding what our benchmark is for what was the case for 2019, let's now take a look at every single individual card and re-rank them to what they are currently in the meta right now. And we're gonna do that in alphabetical order, and that means we're gonna start off with the one from Murakumo that is Ambush Demon Stealth Dragon Shibaraki Victor. And this one was positioned in the in-between slot, and I honestly think it still fits in that category as the clan itself didn't really perform and isn't really performing right now in the premium landscape and the only viable strategy that we have seen right now is the one with the infinite loop and even that isn't really performing at all. But the upside to this card is that it's super generic, can work with any build and it works even for the infinite loop strategy but even if we get new types of strategies this card can help with that. And this card even have its own infinite loop win condition if you manage to get two face up in the g-zone and you have quite considerably soul stacked up so this card opens up a lot of options for the clan itself but sadly the support around the clan is keeping this card from being a very solid choice and the next up we've got great nature's apex science dragon managarmer arum and this card was also in the in-betweener slot but i want to bump this up to the winners category as great nature players have seen success with this card and it's a very very strong potential first try option and with the latest support of the Mysterious Fortune this deck got even more powerful as we got the Isabel combo with the new Great Free and the G Guardian where we can have a pseudo denial griffin effect so Great Nature got more options to their disposal and this is a very strong solid 
first tried option. So I think it's justified to bump it up to a winner's category as it allows Great Nature to compete in the current environment to some degree. Then next up we got the Genesis stride that is Complete Beauty, Amaruda, Ampharos. And this was positioned in the in-betweener segment and I'm personally gonna keep it right in that slot as I still have my questions about how effective this stride actually is, as it doesn't really synergize with most of Genesis strategies, but it is an upgrade to the Amaruda specific build as it synergizes with the Amaruda Grade 3 Strider, but and as a whole with how this card is functioning and what Genesis main competitive playstyle is, it is somewhat in an awkward position and it doesn't elevate the clan to a significant degree where I can say that it is deserving of a winner slot. But it's also not in the loser slot as it is a solid stride with a lot of options and a lot of different skills. So it can always be used in a specific situation which makes the stride a very versatile one. Then next up we got the one for Narukami, the Conquering Supreme Dragon Conquest Full Great. This one was a loser. And it still is a loser. Then next we've got the Bermuda Triangle Stride, Dearly Desired Grand State Shandy. And this was also in the losers category. And I personally got, still going to keep it in the losers category. I've seen players making the argument that it helped Bermuda Triangle. Especially when they got the hit with the LG Guardian. And with all the other restrictions that they got with the first ban list. And that it was a good stride for the Melody Engine with Standard. But... That's basically telling, yeah, the stride is good because we were limited and we don't really have other good scenarios. So now we're going to fall back onto this one. So it's, we don't really got anything better. That's not really a good argument to make to make a card sound good. That's making yourself sound desperate. So this was a loser. So once a loser, always a loser. Then next we've got the stride for Link Joker. That is Death Star Vader, Glue Ball, Avalanche. And this card was an in-betweener and... I think it still is justified to keep it at the in-betweener, but in some regards it can be elevated to a winner's category as the card itself has a lot of potential with controlling the field, gives Link Joker more options to do what they want to do, especially now that it synergizes with the new way how Link Joker is going to play from standard onwards. But overall, I think it's a solid card. It's definitely deserved of an in-betweener spot, but in some aspect you might make the argument that it could bump up to winners, but we lack the amount of tops and wins in regionals to justify that position. The next up, we've got Divine Knight of Twin Absolute Saint of Twin Sword for Royal Paladin, and there was a winner card and I think it's still deserving of its winner position. It hasn't really performed all that much in the competitive and meta scene but it gave Royal Paladin a very solid first try that synergizes with the mechanic of what they wanted to do in the premium strategy and with upcoming Altma support this might even become even better, especially with the new liver rod that was revealed that's, that synergizes with this card. So I think this card is definitely deserving of winner's position and might even become better the more and more Royal Paladin support we're going to see from the next stage and the alt mile trial deck. Then followed up for Royal Paladin, we go to Shadow Paladin and that is Drag Principal Morfessa and it was an absolute winner and I think it still is an absolute winner. It didn't overperform as most people expected it did, but the power and the sheer amount of pressure this car generates is the actual real thing. And I think for that, it's definitely deserving of its position and makes Luard a very powerful and scary strategy when things go their way. Then next up, we've got the one for Numatama, Enma Stealth King Mujin Lord Da Goku. And this one was in the in-betweener slot. And I think it's either in-betweeners or this will fall down the losers category. And the reason for that is... Its skill has some potential, but the main problem with the skill is that it's not a first tried card. So when you go first or when you high roll on your opponent, this doesn't do anything. And even then, you're limited to what your opponent is allowing you to do, as they can cho choose which cards are going to be face up in their G-Zone. And even then, most of the very strong Vanguard skills don't really interact with this card at all, as the only abilities that you can benefit from are auto on attack abilities and most strong stride abilities nowadays are very strong act abilities or continuous abilities or maybe auto abilities behind act abilities like gear next for example or we have auto on attack abilities that synergize with the mechanic which nubatama cannot really capitalize on a very good example is katrina yeah sure you can then superior call things for your tokens but you don't have any tokens on the, on the board so you cannot really do anything so that's the problem with Daigoku that 
in most scenarios you cannot really capitalize on the effect and that's why i hinging on to putting it on the losers category as this card literally did nothing and now thinking about it, yes, it's definitely a loser's card as it did absolutely nothing. Then next up, we've got a very controversial one as we have esteemed deity of abundant waters, Ichikishima. And this was originally a winner, but it should definitely go up to absolute winners. However, they banned the card. So I cannot make a banned card an absolute winner because now that it is banned, you cannot use it. Which makes it, in my opinion, a loser's card. Which is really odd, because it's so powerful. But because it's banned, the card is literally useless. It's wasted money. So I think I can only make it a loser's card. If the card becomes unbanned, it's definitely an absolute winner. The next up, we've got Even Gale, Sarah of Raphael Mitra. This was in the loser's card. And like the already existing loser cards, once a loser, it will stay a loser. Then next, we've got a very powerful card, and that's Evil God Pontiff Gastiel Diamonds for Dark Regulars. And this was originally in the winners category, but this one is gonna bump up to the absolute winners for very good reasons. The reason why it originally was put in the winners category is because of its power potential of the skill, as it's such a versatile skill that will only become more powerful the more support will be released. But at the time of Freeman Collection, we couldn't really super capitalize on the effect besides just NLKing stuff. But then, Phantasmal Steed Liberation dropped. And then we got Brufus and all the other support cards that make the deck insane. So the reason why I put it to winners made it now an absolute winner. And it's 100% justified to put this thing to the absolute winners category where only the strongest and strongest of cards resides. Then from one Dark Zone card, we go to the next one and we come to Fancy Megatrick Dark Lord Princess for Pale Moon. And this one was positioned in the winners category and it's gonna stay in the winners category as it's just a very solid card and it allows Pale Moon to have a bit more aggression and a bit more options when going into stride, especially if they're focusing on the Maggie ability as this one gives you just one extra finger attack for nothing and a rear guard attack as well which is just pretty nuts to think about. Then another winner card is Flare General Dumjit Veiler and this is gonna stay in the winners category. This is just a very solid card for Kagero and it really helps the end and the cross legion strategy by having a very solid first strike right target and they can then follow up with their insane legion plays that can then finish up games when necessary. And Dumjit is just a very good overall pressure tool that could put your opponent in a very awkward spot, which will be used for probably years to come for Kagura. So very deserving of its winner position. Then the next card is Ghosty Great Emperor Big Obadiah. This stride was positioned in the in-betweener slot as on its own with just looking at the skill, it doesn't really do that much as it just set up the board or the deck for a potential future play. But what Grand Blue players have shown us is that this card is insanely powerful and this card can definitely set up a turn 4 Magido OTK turn without much problem. And therefore I think this card is definitely deserving of its winner position so it goes up one rank. It's not an absolute winner as it's a bit slower than most cards and it can be played around it if you're damaging the 9 in the early game which is been seen as a very viable tactic against Grand Blue. The next up we've got another in-betweener card that's gonna move position as we have Golden Dragon Spare Cross Dragon. And yeah this card is insane. It allows Gold Paladin players to almost always stride first whenever they want especially if you put up a pressure against your opponent and they are forced to put the pressure back at you and it just gave you two damage so i think this card will go from in betweeners all the way up to an absolute winner's card as this combined with your ezel engine made some insane plays and allowed ezel to be one of the strongest decks in the premium format for a long time and this card will be a cornerstone for the clan for for probably years to come as its skill is just dead strong with the effect that you can now stride always on top of your opponent first whenever you want, which allows you to set up your ultimate stride turn a turn sooner or at least a turn faster than your opponent, which is a big play. The next up we've got Mega Colony's Guilty Empress Dark Phrase Gredora. And this card was an absolute winner by the fact that you can shut down almost any strategy that relies on superior calling or calling specific units. But the problem is this card doesn't really put up pressure against your opponent by itself. Meaning your opponent doesn't really do anything, but so do you. So there are some problems with this deck in their own 
pressure output and therefore I cannot keep it at the absolute winner's position. I think his skill is still strong enough to be an oppressive entity within the meta because I've seen players make the decision to not play an X deck because Gordora is a thing. The next up we got Interdimensional Dragon History Build Dragon. And this card was in the in-betweener slot and it's probably gonna keep it that position for this moment as it did improve the time leap engine for Gear Chronicle as it allows the deck to function without Chronojet. But it still was lacking certain aspect of the old time leap engine, especially the defensive value of hate around as we didn't have a Chronojet Vanguard. And we had to jump through some awkward hoops to get the maximum capacity of that build. And that's the reason why we haven't really seen any Gear Chronicles in the meta at last year's regionals and in the world championship. And it has been seen in the statistics as zero gear chronicles made a top that year. But this can potentially change with the prospect of the new Chronojet trial deck as well as the next stage extra booster set. So right now this card is in the in betweener slot, but that can change with the prospect of new cards for Gear Chronicle. Then followed up, we've got Shoot Down Sovereign Violence Age for Spike Brothers. This was in the British categories and I think it's still solid of that position. There isn't really much to go around about this card as we haven't really seen that much play for Spike Brothers in premium, but it has to be with the fact that there aren't really that much Spike Brother players out there. But this card is a very solid option for Spike Brother players to have some extra draw power and just some general pressure without really wasting a lot of resources, which is always handy and nice to have in a clan that uses a lot of resources for almost all of their plays. Then followed up, we've got the Dimension Police Strongest Command Chief Final Dimax DX. And this was put into the in-betweeners category. And I think it's pretty solid to keep it there as it's not the strongest stride out there. It's awkward in certain positions and scenarios, but it allows Dimension Police to do some extra plays they couldn't do before, which gives the clan more options. And more options are always good to have. And it's not outright worse than other cards out there, as it's completely different than what DP had before the premium collection. Then followed up, we've got Torrent of Determination Valios Revive. And this card was positioned in the in-betweener slot, as there were some overall issues with this card's skills, as it looked to be not as ideal as you want for an Aqua Forest boss unit, especially as a first tried, as you couldn't really get out of its full potential on the first tried itself. However, Aquaforce players have shown that this card is a very solid addition for the clan as it allows the clan to just multi-tech without any much problem. They can just slam things on the board, draw back into their pieces and keep a defensive value at the same time. So this card allows Aquaforce to be more versatile on different strategies and it also didn't force them to always rely on Alexandros. So I think this is justified to put this thing from an in-betweeners to a winner's category as we have seen some success for Aquaforce with the inclusion of the new values. The next up we go to the infamous Universe Ace Bustard. And this was an absolute winner's card but we're gonna topple it from its pack down to the winner's category as it's nowhere near as strong as we originally have expected but it's not as weak to put it in the in-betweener slot as it's still a very powerful stride that can just win the game out of nowhere if you just set up one universe ace buster turn and you just hit one or two criticals and it's basically done right then and there. Then next up we've got Unrivaled Ruler Gluttony Nerboros and this card was positioned in the winners category and it's a solid foundation to keep it at that position as I originally put the card a little bit higher than most people had give the card granted to it because I saw the potential in Tachikaze, especially with this new Stride Restander that is insanely powerful, that synergizes with the new uh, Tachikaze strategies as well with the cards from the new V era, but also synergizes with the old G era and all the cards from be before that, which make the card very versatile and allows it to always synergize with whatever comes out for Tachikaze as a whole. And we have seen some powerful plays from this card but it's not strong enough to really be predominant in the meta and it therefore cannot go up to the absolute winners category as that category is mainly for clans and cards that are the main face of top tier meta decks and that's definitely why we see cards like the new Gastille, why we see Luart Stride for Morfessa, as well as Sparecross Dragon for Gold Paladin. And then we end up by the last Stride card of this set, and that is Untainted Holy Damsel Green Katrina. 
And this card was positioned in the winners category as we already s discussed at the time that this card, just like Castile, opens up for a lot of potential and a lot of experimentation as it was such a wide versatile use and it probably was at the point where we were still speculating and experimenting well, how powerful this card could be but right out of the woodworks we've got this new token strategy that just was dominating the meta and still is to this day and with the prospect of new support with the whole Asha trial deck and the next stage booster set it can even become more crazier than we already had and that's why this card is definitely going up the ladder from winners to absolute winners as this card was just insane and when we take a look at how this list is reshaping we can see that from how it was before in last year it suddenly is changed a lot we've seen a lot of movement especially in the lower and bottom tier for the losers and absolute winners but the main bulk of winners and in-betweeners stay at the same position as they were as a lot of cars and mainly clans didn't really have the support to make their new strides as effective as they wanted to be but also with the new support that came after this set they didn't really get a lot of additions to their clans to make them more viable in premium and the whole thing with premium is that once a meta is established it's very hard and very unlikely to change things up even with the inclusions of the new sets that come comes afterwards as the main sets that are for standard don't have a lot of direct impact in premium the only big difference in the outlier in this is of course dark regulars but that is because of the fact that a that support for dark regulars was insane and b gastille as a stride allows it to combine it very effectively whatever comes out for the clan and it doesn't matter if it was designed for premium or not same as with katrina as long as they're going to be new token support that card is going to benefit from that in a big way. But this is basically the final standing for the strides from Premium Collection 2019. How they shaped up the meta in the last previous season. And I'm very excited for Premium Collection 2020. What they are going to provide to us. And if they will have an impact with these strides. Or they will just do their own thing that's going to be even nuttier than what we already have with last year. And I cannot wait to the excitement in the, in the whole community. As last year was pretty awesome and pretty nuts. And who knows, maybe this year is just as, or even better. As always, this video has been brought to you by our lovely patrons over at patreon.com slash Insider. You guys are amazing. If you do want to support the channel or everything that's happening on the channel, then head over to patreon.com slash Insider and become a patron today. Well, with that said, I'm Mr. Timeleap, and I'll see you guys in the next one!